So people started using clay all over the world for a lot of reasons. And uh, a lot of that is because this material that you just dig out of the ground is pretty useful. It's it's cheap. It's plentiful. It's easy to manipulate. You can you can make whatever shape you want to, and then it becomes really permanent. So once you've either left it out in the sun to dry or fired it, it stays, right? It stays in whatever shape. So early on, it was used for things like writing and record keeping. So we're looking at a cuneiform tablet here where the uh, th these were used early on for record keeping. This one is apparently recording allocations of beer. And so they kept records of how many, you know, beer or whatever it was that somebody used. And so these were actually usually not fired. They, they're clay, not ceramic, because they haven't been fired. And what would happen is you would write, you know, you'd make the marks in here with your stick, your cuneiform stick, and then if you, if you, you can try this as well, um, if you leave a chunk of clay out that's solid, like a big thick chunk, it is hard, like it's hard to break. The reason we have these things from 3000 BCE is because they are so difficult to break, and so people would, would be able to keep these records pretty easily, even before people got around to doing things like firing the work. So here are some cylinder seals, and it, it, these are uh, just a nice example of, of um, these are, are stone seals that are the tube things, and then they've been rolled onto clay. And so these would be seals that people would actually like wear around their neck, you know, as, as kind of a necklace or whatever. And these were their marks. These were their uh, kind of status symbols. But you see, just like the, se the texture tools we have, you can roll them into the clay and they can leave the, the mark. Now, I put these in here to show you uh, both both because they're kind of cool, and because I want to uh, let you know about early uses of um, of like making contracts and stuff like that. So people would have um, seals or little stamps, uh, kind of kind of like these, but but smaller. And an early contract um, actually developed kind of developed into this. So early contracts, if you were gonna let's say I'm gonna sell, I've got two beers, and you're gonna sell me a cow for two big barrels of beer or something like that, we would take a clay envelope and we'd shape it, you know, just a ball of clay, like a pinch pot, like your hollow pinch pot form. And we'd make a little, uh, a little, two little beer containers and one little cow and we'd put them in this envelope and close it up. And then you and I would take our stamp, our, our, our maker's mark kind of, right? Our seal and we'd press it on this envelope. And that envelope is our contract. And so we, that would be our promise to trade beer and cows or whatever. And if we, uh, had to break that contract if we for you know somebody didn't live up to it we would be able to break into it and find out what uh, what we agreed to trade now of course uh, from that developed writing it down on a thing that you didn't have to open up to double check but it's kind of interesting how these mark makings and these seals were used for identification and legal purposes early on now other this is this is going back even further other early uses of clay is were actually religious or ceremonial now because people were not yet writing stuff down you can see the other one was uh, 3000 BC, uh, 4000 to 1000 BC, and now we're jumping back all the way to 29 to 25,000 BC. <clears throat> but these, uh, these figures are found all over the place and we, or, or all over Europe, I should say, and we don't have, um, records of what they were used for, but we can make some guesses about some of their uses. Now, these are sometimes called Venuses, which is really inappropriate because Venus didn't exist yet at this time. But um, they're also sometimes called goddess figures or just female figures. Um, and you can pretty much tell why, right? It's pretty clear um, which figures are female figures because um, of the large breasts. Usually have large breasts, large hips, no face. Now these one, oops, sorry, these ones have faces, um, and we can see some genitalia suggestions, maybe a little bit of jewelry and stuff like that. What's interesting is these pieces also weren't originally made to be fired. We actually, th or, or fired to be turned into ceramic and kept. We think that there's some evidence that they may have been intentionally 
thrown into fires. Now, these are fairly small figures. Um, in fact, the, the a lot of the Venus figures are, are you know, hand-sized, and they think they may have been used for trade, uh, maybe to s suggest that we're friendly, like, I'll trade you my figure, you trade me yours, we're buddies, we'll, we'll get along, and we'll hunt together or something. Um, but the other thing that they think might have been the case is that these may have been intentionally thrown into the fire when wet or or solid so they had some moisture in them so that they would crack and that may have been part of their use we don't know because nobody wrote down what they were thinking about so um, archaeologists and art historians are really guessing about that sort of thing we know that pottery was used for cooking and storing food um, and what's kind of interesting is this Joman piece of pottery um, which we'll we'll look at some more Joman work in uh, in week uh, seven and eight, I think it is. Um, but these Joman pottery pieces, they can, scientists, archaeologists can actually go in and find like bits of food on the inside. So they know these were used for cooking because they can find prehistoric bits of food stuck to them. Now, you can already tell if you're making stew every day for your whole family out of this one, it's not it doesn't seem like the most convenient form. So because of that complicated top, we think this was probably used for um, ceremonial kind of cooking. Um, we also notice that narrow bottom. Now, if you are making a pot right now and you're gonna make a narrow bottom and a really complicated top, you know that I'm gonna say, mm, is this gonna be okay? Like, is this gonna wanna fall over or something? And that, that bottom was made that way because these weren't put on a table. It was, it was 26, uh, 100 BCE and people in Japan didn't have tables, right? They, they were hanging out outside or, or you know, they, they had different kinds of, of dwellings and stuff. And so these would actually be dug down into the fire pit. So they would be in the ground essentially up to about here or so. <coughs> and then they would be, um, would be used in that way. So um, we know lots of examples of cooking and, uh, and eating and storing food, and I'm not going to share them with you here, but there are many, many more. Now, we also have examples where um, I mentioned the terracotta figures before. This is, uh, you know, a show of power, a show of skill. <coughs> this emperor was really interested in his immortality, and so he had all these soldiers made. Um, it, uh, some of you may have seen a, a number of years ago in Seattle, they had a, a show of the, these, a traveling show of this, of figures or copies of figures from, um, from, this part of China, and they were uh, they showed us kind of how the process was made. These were actually made from molds, a lot of them, um, but they look like individual figures, which is pretty impressive because they had different molds for different kinds of uniforms, different kind of hairstyles, different kind of, you can see some of the guys have kind of a little belly, right? Some of them have a different kind of like top knot or facial hair and stuff like that. And so those figures show the in the intense skill of this sort of army of artisans um many of whom may have been prisoners actually um and then they were supposed to guard the the emperor um as in the in the afterlife because he was he was going after immortality at this time um, now back to cooking and serving and eating, uh, different kinds of forms developed in different parts of the world for very precise use. The, uh, a lot of the Greek vases that we see, these Greek terracotta vases, um, were developed kind of in two directions at once. They, they, a lot of them are wine containers for serving and, and storing wine, but there are also a lot of them really designed for being surfaces to paint on, right? So the paintings get really complex while the forms stay pretty consistent. We don't see a lot of changes in the forms during this time, even though the decoration on the surface changes quite a bit. And these would have been thrown on the wheel. These would have been um, made on a, a spinning a wheel um, using techniques that are a bit like uh, throwing on the potter's wheel today. They also had some molds and things like that that were, were used for certain parts, uh, parts of handles and things like that. Um, now, again, across uh, different parts of the world, we have different kinds of forms. So if you're familiar with tagine cooking, um, you might be familiar with this form that is, has this low dish and then this conical top with a hole on top. Looks like these holes have been covered up. 
Um, and that kind of steaming, sorry, I don't know how to make this work. There we go. That kind of steam cooking has developed with that particular type of uh, ceramic dish, right? That's both for, for cooking and, and you know, serving the food. In Japan, uh, we have, and I've got two cultures stuck on one page here, but in Japan, we have tea ceremony, which has a lot of very specific ceramic forms, like ceramic dishes, uh, ceramic teacups and things, stuff like that, that goes with that prop, you know, that, that ceremony and that event. And the forms become both very expensive and very, uh, you know, precise aesthetic. There, there's a particular type of look to the ceramic dishes. Not all the, you know, there, there's also enamel and wood and metal uh, parts of the tea ceremony, but the, the dishes, the tea bowls tend to be ceramic. Um, it, here is a uh, wedding vase um, from Navajo culture. And so this would be a coil built form that has these two separate pieces that, that are joined together. And so here's another example where a particular form fits with a particular tradition. This is the way we do this kind of form or decoration in a particular place um, or in a particular culture. And I'm just touching on a few of these because there's tons that we can talk about, very particular kinds of forms. Um, this is one I, I kind of enjoy, uh, the, this picture I've pulled from this guy's blog where he talks about this. But so this is a, the, the guy describes going on a train ride in, in India. And he gets a cup of chai at a, you know, chai wala, like a chai you know, tea vendor guy in, as he's waiting to get on the train. Now, what's kind of interesting here is in, in our, you know, I always ask my students when we're sitting in the room together, uh, who's got a cup with them today? And, and people will hold up their cup and it's usually a plastic cup, maybe a reusable plastic cup, maybe a, a throwaway, you know, Starbucks or whatever kind of cup. So these are ceramic or, or maybe clay cups. They, you can see they don't have any glaze on them. And they've actually been fired to just below or just barely bisque temperature. So they're very, really fairly fragile compared to what we're used to. They're also porous, so they're going to leak eventually. But they're also fairly small. And so he, Patrick Shaw describes uh, getting the tea, drinking it, you know, while he's waiting for the train, and then finishing it. It's not going to take you a long time, right? So once he finishes it, he tosses it down and gets on the train. And he says that the, the clay breaks up, right? It, it, the, because it hasn't been fired to a very high temperature, it basically uh, recycles itself just there on the, on the train, or, you know, under the train um, there as they go to... Um, you know, uh, sorry, as, as people are waiting to get on the train, they throw these things down. They aren't trash exactly in the way that we're used to seeing plastic and stuff because they break down so quickly. And he says they actually kind of keep the weeds from growing in that area. Um, so it's kind of an interesting way, not how we usually think of, of clay uh, or ceramic objects and how they're made. These are clearly pretty cheap right? Um, quickly made, not super carefully made, not meant to be beautiful objects like many of the other items we've looked at, but meant to be kind of throwaway one-use items.